Hey everybody, it's Derek Kilmartin from CodeOpinion.com. Concurrency in a multi-user collaborative environment can be pretty challenging, but how you handle that concurrency is really driven by the use case. So let's dive into some different solutions for different situations. So when we're talking about a multi-user environment, you could have many different users or processes all interacting with your system concurrently. And at some point you may have different users or processes that are underlying trying to change the same object, record, document, or whatever the case may be to your database. Now the first strategy is there really isn't one, which means that you have maybe the first user or process that makes a request that's changing some very specific document, it changes that, and then it could be milliseconds later, a minute later, whatever the case may be, is that if another request comes in, it's just overwriting that data. So one strategy is really, it's the last one to write wins. But as you can guess, when I get questions about concurrency, they usually want the exact opposite of this. They usually want that first request to win and the second to fail. Look no further than the real world and manual processes that we can see how these work and we can transfer and use these patterns in code. Before I give what I think is a really cool illustration in the real world, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check the link in the description. I placed an online order to a local store. When I was doing the online order, I noticed that they only had one item available at my local store. So I placed my order, selecting that I would pick up the item when it's ready. So I got my order confirmation, and then a couple hours later, I got this email. Derek, your order is ready to be picked up at, it was my local store. What's also interesting is on the bottom right here, we see we recommend that you pick up your order within seven days. It's, if it's not possible, please contact your local store. Your items, if they're not picked up, will be refunded and placed back onto the shelf. So what's this have to do with concurrency? Everything. It illustrates this really, really well is that there was an item, a single item of the product that I needed that was on the local store shelf. We have multiple people that are going into that store to buy items. If I place my order and somebody else goes and picks it up and there was only one of that item available, which there was, well, then they took the item that I was trying to order. We're talking about concurrency here. We have multiple different actors, users, shopping and potentially trying to get that single item. So what happens is after I place my order, the store was likely notified and then somebody uh, working at that store then has to go physically take the item from the shelf and put it in their back room, essentially making a reservation. They're reserving that item for me. Now I have seven days to go pick up or basically confirm that reservation, getting that item. Otherwise they put it back onto the shelf. Essentially what they've done is they've created like a lock of that item for a limited amount of time. There's like a limited guarantee lock that they've created. So you may be saying, sure, that's pessimistic locking. Absolutely. The idea we could do this with a database, for example, a relational database, where we start a transaction, we select some record from our database, like say it's the product, and we do like a for update statement, which locks the record for writing from any other transactions. Then subsequently, we do some update statement, we can change that particular record, and then we commit our transaction, which releases the lock. So pessimistic locking using our database, that could work. But in this situation, probably not so much because this is a long running business process. We had seven days before we actually had to go get that item. It's not like we're gonna have a connection and transaction open for seven days. So what's a solution for a long running business process like this, but still having some type of locking? We can do this with a reservation pattern and implement it in code. It's really just about creating a time bound lock. So there's three components to this. There's reserve and actually creating the reservation. There's confirming and validating that reservation and expiring it if we didn't confirm it. So the way it looks like is we had our customer, it placed our order, we persisted that to our database, and then our store was notified of this online order that we place. So our store then created the reservation once it pulled the item from the shelf. Now, later on, a few late hours later, I went to the store, I interacted with it, they got my reservation, they handed me the item, they completed that order and persisted to say to the database, yes, this order has been completed. However, if I didn't go pick up the item, after seven days, there'd be some scheduled event that would occur that would cancel that reservation cancel my order and refund me my payment. Looking at a timeline of events, we had an order placed. Then we had an order reserved. 
Now, immediately when that order was reserved, we're telling ourselves basically in the future, we're scheduling in the future that we're gonna expire that reservation in seven days because nobody's come and actually confirmed that reservation. So we're gonna do that in seven days unless somebody completes that reservation then our order is complete, the reservation is done. So even that expired reservation could still occur, but we know the order is complete, so nothing will happen. One way of implementing this is with messaging and queues that support delayed delivery, and most of them do. So that means that when we created that reservation, we're gonna send a message to do that expiry, that timeout, but we're gonna say, don't use this message until seven days. So really what happens is that message looks like it's unavailable to consumers. Consumers don't even know that message exists. Until we hit that timeout, that seven days, then from that point, that message does become available and our consumers will consume that message. So when you're in situations where you have a finite resource like inventory, you've also seen this probably when you're purchasing tickets online to some venue where you can actually pick your seat and you have, when you go through the checkout process, it says you have 15 minutes to complete your checkout, otherwise your seats are released. This is exactly the pattern that's being applied. I have another video that describes the reservation pattern, shows it in code, how it works, and I'll link to that video at the end of this video. Now there's other times where you don't need pessimistic locking. What you're really concerned with is that you present the user with a set of data and then you wanna know that the data that they're making a change to was the latest. And this is using optimistic concurrency. So the idea being is our API hits the database, we return some set of data. With that, we're returning it a version of that data that we know about. So we have one user, we're at version 15 of the data set, and then maybe we have another user, it selects that same data and it's still version 15. Now, if they're interacting with that data and they're say mutating some state, a part of some workflow, and then we have the first user make some type of state change that changes that underlying data, at this point, that's fine because they understood they were working with that current data. But now we have that second user that had version 15, but really it's not at version 15 anymore. It's at version 16 because we've changed it. We want that to fail. So when would you use optimistic concurrency? Well, oftentimes you're presenting the user with data. A lot of things are read intensive, but you don't necessarily know that they're gonna be making state changes or performing some type of workflows or business processes on that data. They may just be querying it and viewing it. So the idea here being is that you're using optimistic concurrency as a way to say, yes, the data that you're looking at is the current data so that whatever decision you make, whatever you wanna do that's gonna occur some type of state change, you're doing it on the latest. And as you guessed, I have a full video that implements and shows code about optimistic concurrency, how you can implement it with an HTTP API. I'll have a link to that at the end of this video. Oftentimes people are thinking about handling concurrency with your database, but there's other alternatives. And I wanna illustrate here, thinking about actors, virtual actors, and a runtime as a means to do this. So for example, let's say we have our client, it hits a load balancer, and we need to make some type of request. With these distributed actors, we could have different app services that host what our actual objects are. So in this case, let's say that the request comes to the third app service, but the object that we're actually looking for exists on the second one in the middle. There's an interaction there that's seamless to us, and that particular object, it's the one making the call to the database. So it does it. But let's say we have another request come in and because it's a load balance, it hits a, our first app service and it's trying to interact with that exact same distributed object. So again, seamless to it, it's trying to interact with that object, but that will wait because that object is single threaded, meaning it will only execute one method at a time. So until that original request finishes and we result back to return back to our client, then we can actually have that second request that came in it invoked that method on that particular object and it will make the call to the database. The key thing about this is that they're single threaded. So it's not just thinking about our database providing the locking mechanisms. We can also thinking about having single threaded objects, even in a distributed environment. And of course I have a video on this that illustrates using Microsoft Orleans in code, talking about concurrency and the single threaded nature of this. I'll have a link in the description to that video. You have a lot of ways to handle concurrency optimistic concurrency using your database, pessimistic concurrency using your database, using other infrastructure in a distributed environment for handling locks, looking to the real world and implementing something like the reservation pattern, or being single threaded, even in a distributed environment, you have a lot of options, but the key is understanding kind of the use case and which one fits appropriately. If you enjoy topics like this, but you wanna go deeper, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. 
Check the link in the description on how to join. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. And of course, here's the links to the two other videos. Check them out.